Sana is Nafterani and I'm from Iran. I studied music and I'm doing a PhD in ethnomusicology and researching about the Iranian music and the Turkish macabs. And I play Khan. And Okay, and um, just maybe a word about the, the research that you're doing? Uh, comparing the modal systems of um, Turkish and Iranian music and focusing on the melody progression. Mm, really nice. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thanks. Um, Ernie Toller, uh, a wing player, uh, saxophone first, and, and uh, studied uh, Indian raga music for a long time, and more and more Mokam music, but mainly Arabic up until more recently, uh, and it seems I'm at the level of that now that I can begin to understand Turkish maqam, at least to you know, begin studying it, and uh, so being here this week was amazing for that. <coughs> I'm Miriam Toller, and uh, I'm a singer. I was born in Egypt but I came to Canada when I was one. And so I actually didn't start doing any kind of modal music till I was in my 20s, um, when my brother needed an Arabic singer for a piece and he only knew me. And I could sing and I could speak Arabic. <laughs> and um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I started studying with an Egyptian um, kanun player, George Sawa. Uh, here in Toronto. He was teaching me songs and then I went to Syria in 1996 and studied Sufi devotional love songs with a, a group of musicians there. And, um, and then I've gone to Egypt a few times to study with teachers there. And um, I find myself in different worlds. Um, even though I don't speak a lot of different languages, I'm comfortable singing in them, and so people, um, and I, I'm not afraid to try different things, so people just like my voice and put me in settings where they want a sort of Eastern sound. <laughs> and um, But I don't know that I would, my voice would be classified in any particular tradition. So. <laughs> uh, my name is Ross Daly. Uh, I'm originally Irish, but I've been living uh, on Crete for the last 43 years. And uh, Crete is where we actually founded the Musical Workshop Labyrinth, that's where it started. It started out initially uh, in 1982 as a sort of a study group of a uh, specific number of musicians and it gradually developed into what it is today. Um, our prime activity is uh, we organize uh, seminars and workshops uh, on Crete every year, about 45 of them. Uh, and the subject matter is music from the various regions of the world where you find what we refer to as modern musical traditions. And just to give you an idea of the geographic location of that, that's approximately everything from northwest Africa up until western China, basically. It's, it's the region where you would find those musical traditions which the more one studies them, the more you realize that they're all interconnected historically and uh, you can actually hear the connection as well. And that they have a lot of shared material, which uh, unfortunately in many cases contemporary political realities don't actually assist people to see that very clearly. And we try to facilitate as much dialogue as possible between those various traditions. Uh, in our particular case, the island of Crete, where we happen to find ourselves, is sort of exactly in the middle of the Mediterranean, and it traditionally has good relationships with both East and West. And uh, it's a place where many musicians who come from these various regions, quite, they all seem to feel at home there, which is very nice. And so we consider that um, it's a very serious uh, cultural sort of prospective really for the island of Crete to be a place to actually host a dialogue of that nature, which maybe is not that easy in other places, uh, in the region itself. And then out of that, <coughs> because we have many students who have been coming, you know, we've been working in our present form since 2002 in, that, in a village on Crete, um, we have many students and colleagues and associates who 
we've been working with for many years and who we know and they know us. And they've taken an interest in opening branches, subsidiaries of libraries in other parts of the world as well. So apart from uh, Araz and Jonathan who, and Pedram who have taken the initiative to start a uh, branch of libraries here in, in Toronto, we also have another branch in uh, Barcelona, in Spain, in North Italy, in Santa Sofia, in Sicily, and on Cyprus. And uh, they're all created by people who are long-time associates of ours, and also there's a very, very good communication between all the different branches. <coughs> and they're all people who are involved in the same activity. Uh, none of us is going to get rich out of this, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> but we don't care. Uh, it's something we do, all of us, out of a love for music. That's, that's our incentive and that's our reason for being here. Uh, so we're very, very pleased that um, this initiative has actually started now in Toronto as well. Um, Toronto has a rather special significance for me personally because uh, I lived here between the age of two and six. Uh, and my father was working here in those, day, in those years. Um, we lived in Willowdale, apparently, <laughs> which at that time was out in the wilderness and was having a serious problem with rabid foxes, <laughs> which apparently doesn't have that problem today. No. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but that's basically. Uh, and so I'm here in the context of uh, teaching a, a workshop in uh, modal composition. That's my main work is as a composer of music and. Uh, playing musical instruments, various ones, especially the Cretan Lira is perhaps my prime instrument. Uh, and to you know, help Labyrinth get off the ground here in the uh, Toronto. My name is Kelly Thoma. I come from Greece. I'm a musician. I'm a student of Ross and uh, I prefer to call myself a student of Labyrinth in general because Ross is not my only teacher, he's my main teacher. <laughs> but uh, through Labyrinth I have, had, I have had the chance to meet many musicians from various uh, musical traditions of the world and learn a lot from them and still learning. I play the Cretan Lira, which is uh, the folk instrument of the island of Crete. It is a traditional folk instrument, but I, I because I have been uh, studying various other traditions, I like to um, to incorporate uh, elements of other traditions in the music which I play. And uh, what uh, mostly interests me musically <coughs> is the creative approach of traditional music, which means uh, creating new beautiful <laughs> music. This is something that should continue and not just uh, be copying the past. This is not of interest to me, to copy the past and play like my grand-grandfather was playing, because I'm not my grand-grandfather, <laughs> <laughs> or grandmother. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am living in 2008. I'm working on it. What? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I'm very interested in uh, contemporary beauty in general. <laughs> and this includes music, which is my, the thing, the, uh, what I love most in life. And I, I am here also to teach, because I am, I am a student of Labyrinth, but I'm also a teacher of Labyrinth. And this is something that uh, actually is very uh, common uh, in, the, in Labyrinth. A teacher can be a student at the same time and vice versa. Uh, the, uh, one week I might be teaching a seminar of Cretan Lira, and the next week I will go to the Afghan Rabab uh, or Afghan Music Seminar to, to learn something new. And many uh, teachers and uh, students are like that because, of course, we never stop learning. This is mm -hmm. obvious <laughs> to everything. So, thank you for coming. Thank you. Kevin, also an excellent composer. I don't know if I'm excellent, but composing is, of course, uh, from what I've said up to now, composing is uh, one of the most interesting things for me in music because uh, I, what I want is to uh, create something new. Uh, for me and for others to enjoy. Let's simple as that. Great, thank you. Um, I want to start with some general cultural um, uh, things and then move into more specific things about what you do in terms of craft and technique and things like that. More specifics, but um, you've already, uh, some of you have already addressed uh, my first point, which, um, or question, 
would be um, to look at the role of the individual in relation to these traditions. So we inherit all this music, all this wonderful um, music and, uh, and, and um, a lineage and meaning and um, repertoire, but we're individuals within that. And so how do you, uh, artists in all traditions have to place themselves within a tradition, whether you're a jazz artist or any music you're playing, you have to make decisions of how you inherit things, you learn them, and then where are you fitting? Are you going to be avant-garde? Are you going to be conservative? What are you going to do? And some of you have already spoken to this, but I wonder if we could uh, just open it up for uh, anyone who wants to uh, kick that one out. How you position yourself within the tradition as an individual, um, and you know whether this is conscious or it's intuitive, it just happens, and later you start steering it, things like that. Well, I can tell you a, a little Cretan folk <coughs> addresses exactly that. And it's the story which is told on Crete of how people learn to play the lyre, which is the prime instrument of the island of Crete. Uh, it's a little bowed fiddle, uh, upright fiddle, this one just behind you there. Um, it's said that you go at dusk to a crossroads and with your bow you etch in the ground, in the earth on the ground there a circle and you sit inside it with your instrument. And after dark, uh, demons appear outside the circle and they try and get you to get out, get out of the circle. But because you know that uh, if you do go outside the circle, you'll be devoured, you stay inside the circle. And after they realize that they can't convince you to come out of the circle, then they ask you, well, can you give us the lyre so we can play? So you give it to them. And one after the other, they play all night, and they're the, the, the best lyre players that exist. And you listen to them all night, and this is your lesson. And you listen to what you may retain as best you can. When the morning comes, uh, they have to disappear before morning light. So um, they, they give you the lyre back. Uh, but before they go, you have to put the tip of your little finger outside the circle, and they eat that as their payment. Uh, anyway. So, one may see that as a quaint little story, and it's rather amusing. But it does have a serious side, and, and uh, you can sort of look at it this way. Let's say the circle is your existence as an individual human being, sort of in this life, and the, tr the demons outside of this timeless tradition which uh, is outside of the realm of time and space as we know it. So this is where your inspiration, and this is where your knowledge is coming from. But you have to do everything in your circle. If you step outside the circle, you'd be devoured by this. And you, you, so this, it's a delicate balance between you're taking everything as well, but you're in your circle working on it as you, yourself. Not, uh, and even just to copy what they do is stepping outside the circle in a way. So everything has to be done. But you give this little bit of yourself which says that, okay, you know, when my time comes, I'll belong to this world as well. You know? But for the time being, here I am in my world, and I have to do things according to that, uh, that reality. So that's the symbolism of that particular little story. And I find it very relevant that um, this shows us that, okay, uh, here we are dealing with these timeless traditions which have immense quantities of time behind them. But it makes no sense just to sort of copy what, as Kelly said, her grandfather did, because you're not your grandfather. <coughs> um, if the tradition is to be alive, it must be carried on by people working with it, on the one hand, absorbing all of the collective knowledge of the past, but working for, in, in the present creatively with it, so that we all have, you know, uh, something to propose to the future. That's, uh, that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. It's a great story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Marion, you already spoke a little bit about this with your <coughs> background coming into it. And so can you fine tune that a little bit more with regard to where you see, what you inherited and what you're doing now? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, um, the interesting thing is because I'm here and my background <laughs> is Egyptian, often people think of me as an Arabic music expert, which I'm absolutely not. <laughs> but I am put in a position to represent Arabic music. And so um, 
I feel like I am honest with them about where I'm at, and but I do feel a duty to learn as much as I can, um, because I do perform Arabic music and I do perform some traditional music, and um, so I continue to um, study with whoever I can find to study with and to get as deep as I can. But I feel like um, when I um, am asked to do different projects, people. Uh, there's something in my voice that they love and um, <coughs> and I love to sing that's all I ever want to do it makes me the happiest mm -hmm. and so um, it's a weird position to be in kind of because <laughs> the funny thing is um, once when I went back to Egypt to study I went with several of my friends who I perform with here and I was in a very strange position because in Egypt I look like everybody but I don't sound like a traditional Arabic singer but my friends who are from here who don't look Egyptian they're like oh my gosh they're, they're singing in Arabic and then and all my friends got asked to uh, perform on stages and there was even a newspaper article written about one of them and I was totally ignored and it was a very weird position for me to be in <coughs> very strange um, how I was judged there and how I'm seen here. Um, and another funny situation happened. I used to go to an Arabic music retreat in the States that's run by Simon Shaheen. And there I would be studying Arabic music, but they would have these open mics. And I remember once I sang a Greek song, and they go, hmm, you should sing Greek music. <laughs> because to them, I didn't have the Arab sound that they're used to of like people who really have spent so much time in that tradition. So it's just very interesting. But um, what I love about being in Toronto is um, you have a million traditions going on, and I love so many different kinds of music. And I've been asked to participate in those different... So I've done um, Indian music things. I sang a Bollywood song that became a huge hit in India. Uh, yeah. um, I've sung in Ethiopian bands. I've sung in so many different contexts. And, um, Iranian concerts, for sure. Yeah, Super. I did a, a, a Persian New Year where we had an Arabic song that was very similar to a, a Farsi song. That, anyway, I, um, I just, I guess I... Toronto is my favorite city because I get to do that so much and I get to collaborate and try out different things and um, but still have my voice mm -hmm. like I'm still Miriam. <laughs> so. Well. Um, so Ernie and Sanaz are both explicitly working with multiple traditions and, and you, you I think everyone is here in one way or another but um, I wonder if you could address that how you situate yourself in the, in the, in the different traditions that you been immersing yourself in? Mm. My have to almost like two parts of me would answer differently. Like uh, one of them is, um, well, uh, Trichy Shankar, who was my main Indian music teacher for rhythm, melody, and everything for, for many years. Uh, he, uh, he, he's a, well, just about him, he, he's like a, an old world level of great that it's it's hard to produce I think in in the modern world because well to summarize he took a year off school when he was seven years old to get more serious so already that's <laughs> this is a different kind of animal and again at thirteen and I think his debut was even like his real debut not playing with storyteller. <coughs> stage concert classical that he was like at 15 so I can imagine the, the level he was at at that is it's I, I still can't even after like I probably have no idea but he, he said simply that just good to uh, master uh, what your I'm paraphrasing him but what your thing is what your tradition is before you um, check out other things and, and it's not it's not like it's not like he's um, uh, completely, he's a human being. If, you, if, if he had to play Darbuka in a Turkish gig, he's not gonna sound like somebody that's been doing it all his life. But he will have a crazy great learning curve because, because of the, the uh, 
devotion he put in his thing and 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 that that's that's the one side but the the other side instead of one answer from two sides I mean the other side I think is you can have um, there's two kinds of authenticity I heard someone say once and, and I think they're both really important one is if you're from a tradition we'll figure out what, if you like that music there's a reason it's great because all of these <laughs> demons or these lifetimes put into it and it's didn't it didn't get uh, it didn't, wasn't created in a generation uh, and but at the same time you are you you're not your grandfather and yeah and, and a lot like I think what Miriam uh, manages to keep keep on because we humble ourselves as students and John Coltrane said go to learning humbly and he knew something uh, but you have you can only be yourself so you can be humble right to the ground but without being uh, humility without humiliation or whatever you know it's like I come here and and, and you know every note Ross is playing it's, it's like uh, I could say it's, you know shows me how much there is to learn but uh, as I was saying like we're talking about how we record this and, and make notes to ourselves notes are good but but also sometimes I can't make notes and and I, I said, if you like it, it actually went in on a, a profound level just by the fact you heard mm-hmm. brought by something and you're touched by it. And maybe at different junctions in my life forward, I will uh, pick up more actual knowledge and maybe the ability to play it and even more appreciation of what it sounded like. But from from Ernie, from you know, from, mm-hmm. from myself, so those are, those are the two worlds, and mm-hmm. try to make them meet. meet. Sorry for the long winded yeah. answer. <coughs> I had to answer for two people. Your <laughs> 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 yeah. left side and right side. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. uh, so Sanaz, you do, you started in Iran and then you went deliberately to Turkish music. How do you yeah. place yourself in those? Uh, my current playing changed after moving to Turkey and uh-huh. when I went there for the audition they just told me like I'm playing center and Khan and <laughs> I don't have any like specific techniques and because I think Khan has disappeared for a long time and then come back and so there's nothing for that so um, the teacher I work with tried to um, create some methods according to other instrument techniques and so it doesn't sound the same way as they play. And so it was so hard to change it. And I found out that it's a transposing instrument because it was a question for me why we have to have the mandals for F. All the mandals is up. I don't know if, you know, like for the F sharp, for the F we can all down. But in Turkey it's not like that. It's all the same, looking the same. So they play from different uh, tune and it's not, um, it's transposed, everything is transposed. And for and there was no, nobody could answer that because we don't have the Persian canon and we played the Turkish canons or the like Syrian canons and they have different system. Mm-hmm. And um, I worked with Ahmed Mitter and, um, and I learned different techniques but I tried not to copy and imitate everything but like learn the techniques and mix it with what I had before and then um, create like have something for me so now when I play with like if I when I play in Iran it doesn't sound Persian in mm-hmm. Turkey it doesn't sound that <coughs> and for Turkish people it sounds like the very old style of quantum playing that it's um, it's very it's very old and doesn't have all these like new techniques the art and stuff and for the Persian, it totally sounds Turkish in any way, if you, even if I don't play with the Turkish intervals. And I like it, it's my way of playing. And I very much like to hear it, actually. <laughs> 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 and um, and uh, it's uh, after going to Turkey, to Istanbul, it changed and I learned a lot. And I can transpose everything easily and I, can, I don't need to write anything down. <laughs> And I like uh, not like for Persian music. We have everything is written for the instrument. Every techniques and ornamentation that we use is written. But in Turkish music, it's not. Every like it's a common notation for every instrument, and it's your creativity to play in ornamental music, like mm-hmm. what you get. And <coughs> so that's. Okay. Thank you. Thank 
Okay. Um, again, you know, I, I, people, I, I, it's impossible to talk about one thing without taking off something else here, so there's going to be some overlap um, with these points. But um, could we move over, please, to the, the talking a little bit about balancing studying and learning and pursuing something and then actually playing with it? Like, I think that's at the base of what a lot of comments are coming out here. So we spend a lot of time listening and recordings are hugely important. I think that's how most of us get started. We hear some music on a recording. We, uh, at least here in Canada, that's how it works with this music. Um, I'm from Winnipeg. It wasn't, uh, you know, um, there wasn't a lot of this music uh, available to listen to live. Um, but the time that we spend actively pursuing and studying and learning and trying to get it right, and then once you have that together, just like with the circle, mm -hmm. letting it go and being creative with it and playing with it. So wouldn't want to call it work and play, but maybe study and play and mm -hmm. study and creativity and, and how you deal with that and, and what your personal experiences are with that or personal approaches. Um, so, my, like, um, I did the, during my master's, so I had to compare the, like, for my thesis, I did this comparison again, so, I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> uh, for, like, by learning it, I take the, like, the fourth <coughs> and the fifth and the melody, and then I play with it, like, it's a puzzle put together with the previous, like, with the dasmas and the macams, and then, not being um, um, limited into that kind of structure, but taking the theoretical parts and the like the scales or the intervals and the like going with the fourths and fifths and then mix it with the macams and then create something. That's what I learned from that with the research team. A hybrid of the two systems that makes sense to yes. you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'll throw that open to anyone who wants to jump in. Um, I'm not sure if I have understood the, uh, the point correctly, but I, I maybe what I want to say uh, around the topic of uh, I learn something traditional, for example, how I use it creatively, this is what you, you yeah. mean. Um, I feel uh, privileged that I'm not uh, an exponent or uh, I'm not originally from any specific tradition. So I'm not, tradi I'm not really Cretan, Cretan. Uh, I, I don't have a, an origin, a strong origin of Crete. And not from anywhere really. I come from Athens, I grew up in a city. This is a privilege. It is a disadvantage on one hand, but a privilege on the other hand. So when I learn something new, I don't feel uh, from my tradition for uh, when I say my tradition, I, I say Crete because I live on Crete. So the closest tradition to, to which I am is Cretan music, but I'm not originally from there. So when I learn something Cretan, because my family is not Cretan, Cretan, uh, I don't feel the heavy burden on my shoulders to prove, to prove that um, I have mm -hmm. to continue mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. I have to um, to preserve this or play it of, with an authentic way. I feel free to not to to make it modern, but make it contemporary. These are two different things for me. Uh, for in my head, the word modern has a, a negative connotation, whereas contemporary means something more positive. If you don't know what I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure my English is not uh, no, 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 very, very, very well. Very well. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> this uh, not being, um, tra not having strong traditional origins uh, can be a good thing. <laughs> For me, yes. it can be liberating, exactly. <laughs> it can, uh, being uh, very traditional and growing up in a traditional family, in a traditional musical environment, can also, of course, be fantastic and very mm -hmm. helpful. I mean, I listen to kids like five, six, ten years old and they play, um, they have this beautiful color that I will never have, of mm. course, because I didn't grow up mm -hmm. in a family like mm. that. But uh, when they become 18, 20, 25, and they are full-fledged musicians, what will they do? Will they, maybe they only copy the past, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, they are more in danger to copy the past than mm. me. 
but of course I've never played like them. <laughs> so this is this is a balance. This is how I see myself uh, in this uh, in this music. I try to see it in a positive way, and I think it is very positive. But I don't have this burden. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, we have multiple musical identities. Exactly. Uh, we, we start just because we're born into a certain, you know, particularly in a place like Toronto, you're surrounded with this. And it's already an internet connection. You can, you can be anywhere. And you know, sense things. There's a very delicate balance, actually, between being a perpetual student and also an exponent of music, how she plays it and performs it. Um, it, it's a difficult balance, which I've seen many musicians actually have trouble with that. Um, for a start, I think everybody who plays music uh, of any genre whatsoever starts out in the very initial stages of what they're playing, of what they're studying, and they have in their mind's eye a vision of themselves actually playing. Um, and this is something which sort of pulls them forward in a way. As you go along, uh, you have to also deal with the fact that what you are currently doing is much less than what your mind's eye is seeing. And so you have to balance these two things out. And that problem never goes away. That's a sort of a donkey with the carrot. (laughs) (laughs) The closer you get to it, you think you get to it, the further away it goes. But you have to learn to balance those two things so that you can always keep in your mind's eye this vision of yourself several steps ahead of where you are today, but also be able to accept yourself today as who you are and what you are. Because I, I do know some musicians who have a problem with that, and they, this vision of themselves 10 steps ahead negates their ability to accept themselves today, and then they, they, they can't play, or they have a problem with being terribly nervous in front of other people, or something like that. Uh, so it's, it's a very delicate balance which people have to maintain whereby they are able to maintain this vision of themselves 10 steps ahead, or maybe more, but also to be able to accept the reality of themselves today and to be able to do what they do and offer it to other people. Mm-hmm. So it's a delicate balance, and mm-hmm. it's, it's a very important thing for musicians to learn. Mm-hmm. I like to learn to accept uh, heartfelt compliments from people who are in the audience. I come off as a young jazz musician, I come off stage, basically just want to go in the dressing room and practice because I, I sucked and I could tell you everything I did that sucked. Uh, and they would come and say, <coughs> say not only be complimented, but they'd say, yeah, that one part you played, it took me, it took me uh, to this other place and I'd be thinking, yeah, it sucked, it sucked. <laughs> But then over a few years, I thought, no, don't be a jerk. They actually liked it and they're no less of a... a uh, they're entitled to like they're that. Very, yeah, and maybe they know something I don't. And we still, I want to go practice room and learn those things. That's okay. I can have my neurosis back. But, <laughs> but take this moment as something real as well. And, yeah, and then I'm not so daunted. Um, well, as a student of Arabic music, I do definitely feel intimidated depending on who my audience is. So... Um, when I'm singing to the general world music audiences, um, I feel pretty comfortable, especially when they're not Arabs. (laughs) Because um, they seem to just appreciate my voice and like whatever it is that I'm presenting. But um, every now and then I'm asked to do something like most recently we were asked to sing for uh, an Arabic audience. And that I find very intimidating. And I, because I know I don't sound like they expect or whatever it is that they're craving to hear. (laughs) Um, So that uh, is an intimidating thing. Um, But at the same time, I'm quite confident in my vocal abilities. And so in some ways, I just don't care. (laughs) So I just, so I just do what I do. And if uh, if you like it, great. And if you don't, that's fine. That's, um, uh, and so I, I'm at odds, like with Arab communities in a way, like I'm not really connected to the Arab communities, but I have lots of people who are Arabs who, when they hear me, they're so, they love what I'm bringing to them. So. I just accept myself. And also, um, like you, I like to create new things. So, and I'm not, 
I didn't um, grow up studying how to write music or anything like that, and I'm quite intuitive. So lots of songs that I've written, I would be like in an intense study period in Egypt, and then I would have dreams, and I would dream of like uh, somebody I know playing this beautiful melody on Kawa, and then I would say, oh, here, and, he, and I would write a song. You could just, remember it from the Yeah. Wow. So, like, well, what I would do is I'd wake up and then I would sing the melody in well, any recording device. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, so, no, that's a real deal. <laughs> that's a real deal. <laughs> so, and then, um, and I've come up with some music that I don't even know where it came from, like, but I just think, oh, that was really nice. I really like that. And, and um, it seems to connect with people, too. You've been very prescient tonight because my next question was about audiences, oh. and, and here you go. Um, uh, so I wanted to ask you what kind of audiences you're playing for, and then the degree of knowledge that they have of what we're doing, because particularly with new modal music, we, we all come from quirky kind of mixture backgrounds, and uh, when you're presenting this music, and there's all kinds of different gigs that you have, um, audiences are an important part of the whole music culture, we're not just sitting in our room and playing for each other. Uh, and the golden ages of, of, of so many um, uh, of these traditions were centered around really discriminating audiences who would, uh, you say, hold your feet to the fire when you went up to the end. Yeah. So um, could we please talk a little bit about audiences and what your experiences have been? Uh, that was a great kickoff. If we could go around the table with that, please. Anybody? I'm <laughs> dangerous, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, well, I mean, how do the, the things we discussed about our own musical experiences relate to uh, being with in front of? Yeah, and how audience? how 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 does that affect your creativity and and like, um, is when you're. When you're working on a composition or something, so obviously Miriam just said these are gifts, you know, and that's there's a lot of amazing stories through the history of that. It's extremely special. Um, but is this how much is this on your radar when you're creating? Or do you have a specific audience in mind? Uh, sometimes it's commissioned and you do have a specific audience in mind. But just what's the range of anything you want to say about audiences? I was thinking uh, Ross was speaking earlier, uh, and uh, it was a thing in probably heard similar thing before about as a performer ideally you're you're a conduit especially when it on the day where it feels really good it just kind of goes through you and when ross said the, the things that you're not necessarily playing anything new the mathematical possibilities for whatever you might do exist already but with your training and the right mood you some you can access some stuff and then you share it and, and and I think we we joke that that can make you seem like a lot of pressure but it also takes the pressure off in other words you just let it happen stay out of the way and be able to your training is essential mm -hmm. but that, that I think that's that's one thing and Ross also mentioned a thing which I've heard other people speak of about well to Jihad Rassi I mentioned him because he, besides being a, a beautiful musician, he he likes to think about such a question. And he came up with it was a, it was almost going too far, but it was perfect every detail of it. He put a feedback loop, he drew a, a, a flow chart of a nice performance, all the factors going into it, including the audience, yeah. and and and, uh, and and part of it was even to teach the Arabic. Word home out, Samia, the listeners, yeah. the uh, educated, but more than educated, like people just um, uh, in in the audience who would be part of it. And there is a there is a feedback loop of some sort. And and Ross talked about the difference between in that same conversation about house concerts versus say a, a big concert or whatever, because you do. Uh, I mean, probably whatever's coming to me now to say in conversation is probably because of this environment and mm -hmm. everyone there. So, yeah, it's it's real. <laughs> so, Sana, as you were mentioning earlier, you were playing uh, Kanun and the Turkish uh, audiences have a certain reaction and and and, and 
Persian audience is another one. Uh, who are you aiming at? Are you aiming at Nobody. That, that's not an issue. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. um, no, like it depends what like knowledgeable audience not care like not caring about what you play, just enjoying the music, or they are there for criticizing you, or it's mm -hmm. like an audition, or mm -hmm. depends what type of art in, so mm -hmm. then the level of frustration changes. So, and yeah, and but I think that yeah, I don't know how to put it, like it depends on what type of artist you get, so the play the performance would change because. Adjusted. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, for me, the level of uh, stress doesn't change mm. uh, depending on the audience. Uh, mm. But I uh, respect the audience who is in front of me. Not that I don't pay attention to them like they don't exist, but I feel more into myself when mm. I perform music. Um, and I think uh, because with Rose, I have had the chance to play for various, very different kind of audiences, from children to dogs, <laughs> you know? <laughs> 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 to the high From <laughs> 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 huge venues to house concerts. I think actually maybe what changes the atmosphere more is the space rather than the people themselves. Mm -hmm. So it depends on where you play more mm -hmm. than the people themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it's different to play for uh, to play Cretan music for Cretans. Uh, Cre is it Cretans or Cretans? What is it? <laughs> Cretans. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> it's different to play. <laughs> it's different to play Cretan music for uh, Cretans because they're knowledgeable and they know what you are doing right now. It, it's not like I'm trying to prove that they play Cretan music well, but I think that they can enjoy more than an Australian. But the Australian, if I go to Australia to play with Ross in a house concert, uh, for people that haven't heard, uh, that have never heard uh, modern music, have never heard, uh, they will appreciate something else which the Cretan will not. Mm -hmm. You know true. what I mean? Uh, they will hear, they will listen to the music naked of all the external mm -hmm. elements. So both are really, really, really enjoyable, and uh, really with not much or less stress or all this. Um, this, this was for, for, for Canadians, I mean, that's how we get into it. We listen to music. We don't, I didn't have a clue what this was. I just mm -hmm. heard the music and you fall in love with it, and that's really powerful. It's, you don't need to know. It's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. direct communication. It can be more powerful sometimes, actually. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Because the audience that uh, has expectations from you, uh, yeah, it's, sometimes it can be, not for me, as I told you, not, it's not stressful, more stressful. It is always a bit stressful, but the level of stress doesn't change. Uh, maybe for them, it would be more powerful to listen to a good jazz musician, <laughs> you know, than to listen to Cretan music, because they listen and they, at the same time in their brain, the things are translated to something that they have listened, they are comparing mm -hmm. to something they have already listened. So there is a comparing procedure all the time in their brain that doesn't let the brain, the soul, yes, relax and really listen, you know? You know mm -hmm. Very scientific <laughs> approach. <laughs> I think the question of audience is actually is extremely significant. And there's the certain reciprocal nature of the whole experience. Uh, I mean, <coughs> you described uh, the audiences who are people who know this music and they're sitting there and they're very austere and they're waiting to sort of. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> in certain traditions, that's extremely uh, evident. Uh, I remember being told by uh, one of India's foremost tabla players, Shubankar Banerjee, who that there is a specific music festival every year which takes place in Calcutta and all the young aspiring musicians have to go there and they have to perform and in the front row are all the uh, sacred cows of Indian music <laughs> 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 just waiting to tear them to pieces yeah. you know. 
and it's a really grueling experience. Mm -hmm. And if you fail in this experience, you're finished. That's it. Mm -hmm. You don't have a future. You have to get through this. But that, in my view, uh, is something which is very, it's actually very unmusical and it's actually very destructive. Ah. It's equally destructive. It's the opposite of the musician, the virtuoso, who sits in front of his audience and he wants to prove something. And it's like he's sitting there with this sort of melodic Kalashnikov ready to riddle you with musical bullets in a way. But it's, it's a very unpleasant experience. So, what both the audience and the musician have to understand is they have to, uh, I mean, there's a certain category of musicians who say, I only play what I feel and what I enjoy and what I like. If that pleases the audience, that's okay. There's another category who says, well, I'll play whatever they ask of me. Um, and I prefer to, to think that, okay, I can only really be myself, but can I put myself in the position of my audience and see what that experience is like? Because there are certain things which we as musicians do, which are great fun for us, we really enjoy it, but it's terrible to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have to be able to you know, sort of make a certain distance there and sort of put ourselves in the audience's position. Is this an enjoyable thing? You know? Because uh, our ultimate goal is to offer something beautiful to these people, uh, not to riddle them with musical bullets, not to do anything like that. No, that, that's not what, what it's about. Mm -hmm. It's about offering something of beauty to these people and something of, which will be meaningful for them. Uh, otherwise, sit in your room, play by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's something that the audience has to be open to this experience. They, they can't be full of expectations which are unrealistic. Then they're sort of stepping outside of their role as well. If they're sitting there waiting to judge you and things like that, that that's, that's not a very musical thing to do. They should be willing to accept what you have to offer. And then, of course, they will be honest with themselves. They say, well, did it actually say something to me or did it not? Okay, you know, sometimes it doesn't work. You have to accept that as well. Um, but also the musician should not be concerned with... Uh, I mean, there's basically this two categories of musicians, the one who everything he does, says, plays, everything is saying, look at me. And there's another category of musician who everything he does, says, plays, etc. is saying, listen to it. Mm -hmm. So for me, the second category is of interest, mm -hmm. uh, where you're not sort of saying, you know, look at me and judge me or, you know, sort of appreciate me. No, you're offering something and what you're offering is, is of significance. And so it, it's a relationship between the musician and the audience. There must be something reciprocal going on. There must be openness on both sides. And uh, the whole experience should be the one about the other and not each one about himself. Either the one being a very austere judge or the other one trying to prove something. Yeah. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. I always felt, uh, uh, as Kelly mentioned, that the space is really important. It is. It is really intimate music, and I've always felt, and I've heard great masters perform in large audiences, and it's just very rarely moved me in a large doesn't audience. Really it doesn't seem to carry. <clears throat> and I'm wondering if that, if you. Well, that, that's definitely true. I mean, there are certain genres of music which just don't lend themselves mm -hmm. to massive venues and things like that, and they really need the intimacy. Um, Unfortunately, many many artists do tend to have this sort of rather ambitious side that I want to play in this big venue and things that they think it's something uh, to their credit. Whereas, in fact, what they do is sometimes much better suited to a smaller and more intimate environment where it can actually work. And, uh, we're not all rock stars, <laughs> so mm -hmm. we get up in these stadiums. And, and I, I personally wouldn't like to do that, actually. Uh, I very rarely feel comfortable in venues uh, in excess of 500 people at the very mm -hmm. most, yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe my point was not so much, uh, didn't have so much to do with the size of the venue, mm -hmm. but the construction of the venue as well. Yes. No, like, mm -hmm. amphitheatrical uh, theatres are much better for uh, instrumental music. Mm -hmm. yeah. For uh, I say instrumental music because this is uh, our focus. Uh, for example, uh, stages that are lifted, I think they're, they're called Ital Italian stages. Mm. Uh, the theatres that the stage is very, very lifted mm. and the audience is uh, down there. Even if it's the best uh, theatre, they don't work. They don't work. Mm -hmm. So, 
even very, very big uh, theaters, but if they are amphitheatrical, they are fantastic. There is a, you know, a Peterborough theater in Greece, a huge theater of 15,000 uh, seats. 15,000. Mm -hmm. It's a stone theater, ancient. And uh, the stage, um, it's called orchestra, the circular stage. Uh, if a musician or a person sits in the middle of the stage and uh, sings one note, then this note is heard, can be heard by any, mm -hmm. from any point of the, yes. Mm -hmm. And if a person sits on one of the seats, make the top at the top and s sings one note, uh, it cannot be heard on the... It's one way. It's one <laughs> way, yes. So, I mean, there's <coughs> a lot of thought and a lot of science behind the construction of this theater. It's not just a space. <laughs> it's really... Uh, so there are huge places that are fantastic to play, small places which are horrible to play. <laughs> so it's not a matter of size of the This is the construction, the, uh, the atmosphere. Yeah, this theater which you mentioned, uh, Epidabros, it's... Uh it's an ancient Greek theatre. It was constructed uh, right next to the, um, the clinic of Asclepius, who was the father of modern medicine. And it, it actually had a therapeutic use. Uh, it has the most perfect acoustics of anywhere in the world, apparently. And uh, underneath the circular uh, orchestra, which Kevin mentioned, there are buried uh, four massive uh, ceramic spheres, which are half full of water. Yeah, and this apparently is part of the reason why the sound is so extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they do to demonstrate the acoustics is they send somebody up to the very last seat at the very top, and somebody goes in the middle of the orchestra and tears a piece of paper, and you, wow. you, you hear it perfectly up at the top. Wow. It's, Where is it? it's in the Peloponnese. It's, uh, uh, it's called Epidavros. Uh, it's uh, in the eastern side of the Peloponnese. Uh, very close to Argos. I don't know if they made it uh, by chance because there is no other like it. Mm. <laughs> so if, if they knew how to make it, if they really made it with knowledge, why isn't there another one? Yeah. <laughs> a smaller <laughs> one, not 50,000, a smaller one. <laughs> yeah, there is actually a bigger one in Bologna, which, oh, is, which is apparently almost the same. Almost the same. Oh. But, uh, bigger one? Yeah, it's 20,000, yeah. Mary, let's uh, give you the last word on this topic. You started it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's see, I don't remember because we talked about so many things. <laughs> so just about like different audiences and different venues. Anything, anything else you want to add? You don't have to add anything else you like. Um, well, one thing that I do like is um, I only work in projects where I love what I'm doing, mm. and I because then I can just totally give my whole self to it and just uh, immerse myself. So I have to just love everybody I'm playing with. And um, one thing that I found by doing that is, um, in a way, the projects that have found me or that, in a way, I visioned and came to me, they also put me in the best light as well. Um, uh, and I guess, um, I don't know, uh, I guess I feel like um, even though I'm not master musician of any music. <laughs> um, I'm master musician of my own voice and by being um, particular about who I work with and what I do and totally being passionate about it, I seem to be able to give myself wholly and then um, I do feel the feedback loop and I get a huge feeling back from the audience and from the people that I work with. So. I've never played in a huge venue, and I don't know if I would work in a huge venue. Like, I've probably maximum been in a 500 seat venue. But um, uh, I guess I feel like I'm now midway through life. I just turned 50. And I feel like uh, I just feel more and more confident about who I am and what I'm doing and what my voice is. Yeah. And I feel happier and happier in what I'm doing. That's one of the gifts of aging, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> you start to yes. accept yourself. You think, well, this is the way I play. It's not going to change too much. Yeah. 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 Might as well enjoy it. You'll yeah. see. Great. <laughs> maybe you're there already. Okay, um, maybe we could uh, shift to some more um, 
technical craft of things. We've already touched on that, I think. But um, um, how do you go about building a repertoire? Or what is your personal story been with building a repertoire? Was it uh, um, just any anything you'd like to? If we could just get some responses around the table. From, from your student days to what you're doing now, the kind of repertoires that you built and how you went about it, and what your thinking was, your priorities. And okay. oh, I never stopped learning new pieces. I learn as much as I can, learn, 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 learn never stops. And because I play the Cretan Lira, I tend to focus on, the, on this repertoire. But uh, I learn what uh, the pieces which I like. I, learn, I listen to a piece, I like it, I want to learn it, that's it. And it grows, 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 grows. I think this never stops. Maybe one at one, in one day, uh, the, <laughs> the memory space will <laughs> be full, I don't know. <laughs> but I continue to learn. And, uh, the thing is that when you learn a piece, uh, I think it's very good to perform it. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a very good uh, way to actually learn it. Because you can memorize it, but then do what with it? You have to perform it. <coughs> to become part of your repertoire. That's what I, I do. That helps you really bond with it. Yes. Uh, also, one of the things about Kelly is that um, she doesn't rely on reading music. Um, she, and so she learns everything by ear and, uh, and actually remembers everything. So yeah. She has a very large repertoire of which she's committed to memory. Which is, That's why I'm yeah. worried about that. <laughs> 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 I think it's like a workout. The more you do it, the more you I think so. Do it. That is true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I had a good memory, and then I could I start to I learned to read music quite late. I was like nineteen or twenty, and uh, then uh, once I started reading, my memory started feeling you know, just lazy. I was like, that happens. I would I would laboriously learn something from the score and then memorize it, but then once I got more fluid with it, my you know, so it's just what you're doing. I think yeah. memory works when it absolutely has to. If, if, if you yeah. give it a backup, it is over. Mm. And of course, we've gotten very lazy now yeah. with our memory. I mean. Even phone numbers. How many phone yeah, numbers? We cell phone numbers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just press yeah. lines, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we're, yeah. we're really losing a lot there. Um, others with repertoire. Sanas. It's, uh, the same learning and then adding to the repertoire. I think. Do you target certain things or? Mm, no, and I rely on reading music, so I don't memorize anything, and um, yeah, but I just. Like when I'm studying it, I by analyzing for the macams and learning the macams, so I learn more stuff. And now I really into like more folk Turkish folk music, the half music, and trying. They say this, so you can play those with kana, and kana is the classical music, which I don't think so. Mm -hmm. It's possible to play anything, mm -hmm. and um, and I like like trying to kind of. Um, learn some folk music and play it with the con and, and most of them are vocal so some of them like most of them doesn't sound very sounds good but most um, they are more repetitive so you have to do something with it for not being boring and repetitive and sound the same as with it. It's mainly Turkish music. Yes. Yeah. What about Persian music? Persian music now I'm not that much like not that I'm not interested, but like that's what I learned for so many long like for a long time. Now I'm into more Turkish music and comparing both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me it's a it's a challenge and I'm at a point in my life where I'm trying to, um, well, while I'm still trying to learn, there's three main areas like there's jazz and the raga music and Arabic maqam but the, the, the repertoire I have in those is uh, somewhat is disparate the right word like there's still some separate I mean there's like a, a zillion jazz tunes that I know that in the context or whatever I can play them and even ones I don't know I can pick them up because I know the components uh, and then there's stuff that I learned uh, studying raga music that I can do when that situation arises and then there's Arabic songs I didn't know where I learned them forever but oh I, I can play that what's that called but then connecting those is 
is weird. So now at 53, I'm a student at, for the first time at York University, and, I, and I'm thinking, what better thing to do my thesis on than the things I love and try and, like they're, maybe they don't totally fit together, but in my mind they do. So I just want to write a, an etude book for, well, I could say the world would win player, but I just mean me. <laughs> <laughs> you I want to watch all the things I really love. And, it, and if some of the things fit together really well, which they do, then great. And some of them might not, then fine, not every branch grows another branch, whatever. But, but it's all part of the, the root, which is me. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it, I do have to kind of um, encapsulate the whole thing, at least for 2018, Ernie, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think it might make the next 10 years for me, hopefully, more um, cohesive. But if it doesn't, it's okay. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'll just be able to do certain gigs in different areas, like the person who speaks different languages or maybe has a few societies they function in in their life and they don't necessarily meet. I don't know. No, it's really difficult. I, I can totally relate to that myself because I've, I've learned separate repertoires and then when I listen to them, particularly when I'm improvising within those languages, I realize it's bleeding through anyways, mm -hmm. you know, so at a certain point it's just, you know, it's really hard to keep them contained and it's... Uh, yeah, and, and, and in some ways you shouldn't keep them contained as much as you can, you know, want to have a quest to make them all the your things, you know, as... as fine as you can make them they're not they're not they were all they are is uh, many people's lifetimes uh, and then you take a snapshot of them <coughs> and you render them how how you see them but they're not fixed things carved out by God for all time <laughs> but they're like I, different rivers they're different <coughs> traditions right and that's what makes it. and so Ross you've been dealing with this for a long time as a composer yes, and, yeah. Yeah. well I also took an interest in, <coughs> I, I noticed that the, for example, we have certain songs on Crete and more or less the same song can be found in Syria, more or less mm -hmm. the same song can be found in Turkey, more or less mm -hmm. the, song, the same song can be found in the Kurdish regions of Iran, for example, or things like that. And so I thought quite a lot about that and, and I, I noticed something which I found to be very interesting, especially through my connection with older musicians of the old generations, which uh, and how they had a rather different approach to things. Um, the approach of people, even of my age, which is not that great, anyway, but, um, even of my age, uh, we are all affected very seriously by the phenomenon of recorded music which, on the one hand, that's been uh, much to our advantage. We've been able to approach a lot of things through that, which we wouldn't have been able to otherwise, perhaps. But it's also worked somewhat to our detriment. Uh, and one of the reasons is that when, you, when we learn something and we hear it from a recording, there's a certain set-in-stone quality to it, which is not actually uh, how it should be. And it's certainly, certainly not how it was. Um, for example, uh, on Crete where we live, um, lyric players, they'll have a, most of them sing and, and play the instrument, okay? And they usually have to play for people to dance. And so each lyric player has this big bag full of melodies and another one full of lyrics. And then he also knows different styles from different regions. So he'll see the person dancing and he'll see from the way he's dancing what village he's from. Mm -hmm. And he'll perform, bring a piece out of the bag and play that. But what he has learned is just the bare skeleton of a melody. And he takes this and he embellishes it as he goes along and he watches the dancer, he does that, and he thinks of something to sing and sings that. So what he has is he has a huge reservoir of all these little snippets and little bits and pieces which he's able to put together in the spur of the moment for the right occasion and mm -hmm. which actually works in that moment. Mm 
And so I tend to think, you know, I try to take that as an example and try to work as best I can in that context. Uh, because it seems to be the way that many of these traditions did actually work in the past. Not all, of course. I mean, there are certain traditions like the Turkish classical tradition, which you know, have these very long and very intricate compositions. But even those, uh, I, I discovered that, you know, we receive them today in sort of big books of Western notation. It's all written out exactly as it should be played. But that only happened at the beginning of the 20th century, and that up until that time, they had an old Armenian system of, of notation in which you were given the notes and you were told the rhythmic cycle that this is performed in, and you were actually quite free to sort of spread them out over this rhythmic cycle as you wished, really. Uh, and so there was a lot more freedom and a lot more uh, people were much more absorbing sort of phrase material and what you might refer to as melodic archetypes in a way, with mm. which they could work quite freely in any given moment, making that which they do relevant to that moment. Mm -hmm. So I've always found that approach to be particularly mm -hmm. interesting. And uh, it's also very, very helpful because when you have to work with different ensembles and different musicians, you know, you're not always playing every day with the same people. Mm. So if you have something which is this sort of second stone thing coming from the recording industry, and you have to deal with different musicians every day, it becomes a problem because uh, you cannot expect of different ensembles and different musicians all to sound the same. So you have to see, oh, what does this musician need? You know, what, what, what's, what can I give him that will bring the best out of him? Uh, and they have to see you in the same light as well. So that's how I tend to, to look at the question of repertoire, really, is looking more at musical and melodic archetypes rather than set in stone forms and structures. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, well, for the repertoire that I do, I have a really huge range because uh, growing up I was doing pop music, you know, Prince and Joni Mitchell and Kate Bush and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, in my 20s I started studying Arabic music and I started meeting the people in the world music scene here and then I joined an Arabic and Greek band and started learning Greek songs and then joined a Sicilian band and started singing Sicilian music and then so an Ethiopian band and singing Amharic music. <laughs> so I just uh, have been picking up different parts of repertoire, but I've always loved folk and pop music. And I feel like now I'm kind of coming back to it. One of the instruments I kind of picked up, I don't play like a master, is the panoon. So I got a panoon from Syria. And one thing that, my latest thing that I've been doing that I love is there are some songs that are just so beautiful to me. And I've been coming up with Hanun arrangements, but they're not Arabic songs, they're like Joni Mitchell song <laughs> or, or Kate Bush and singing and playing, just accompanying myself with a Hanun. And also, um, I've been working with a storyteller who, uh, and I've been doing music and she's been telling stories and we realized one story that she does that we've been working on, she, the source she found it from said it was from Armenia and then I was describing the story and my friend said, no, no, I, I know that story from She's Palestinian, <laughs> and I know that's right. And I think there there was not so much borders. And I remember when she was telling me the story, and I was trying to think of music to accompany it. I said, "Oh, it was a the lead of the story is this daughter of a shepherd." And I go, "Oh, I know this Arabic song about a shepherd," and I knew I wanted to use it. And one thing that happened was it just mirrored the story perfectly. It's this Arabic song that I learned that's from Bilad Shem like Jordan, Palestine, Syria area. But it fit perfectly with the story that she thought was from Armenia, and it was like they were meant to be together. And um, I find now I am just bringing all the different things I like and letting them live together. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> yeah. Actually, Bella Bartok himself wrote an article about the negative impact of nationalism in the study of music, and he quoted an example of a song which was claimed by both the Hungarians and the Romanians, and they were very insistent, no, this is ours, no, no, this is ours, but they were actually fighting about it. 
And he pointed out that, uh, in fact, uh, there was an older version, which was from Greece, of the exact same story. <laughs> 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 the exact same <laughs> but then there was an older version of that as well from somewhere else. And these things were just the shared culture. And, uh, each one had their own take on it. That's one of the great things about being an outsider, being a Canadian, studying, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, Anglo-Canadian studying this music because you don't have any allegiance to it and, and you're not a threat to any of these traditions so people you can go hang out with the Turkish musicians and just go yeah okay so it's your music and this is all yours and then great I love it and go to the Iranians they say the same thing <laughs> <laughs> well, this, is, this is actually a, a very significant problem because uh, you know this music much of it and we and ourselves live in a region of the world uh, which in which you find a lot of contemporary nation-states with extremely ancient names. Mm. Uh, Greece, Egypt, Israel, Syria, you know, Iran, India. These are very, very ancient names, but as political entities, they're all younger than Australia. <laughs> um, so what has happened is that they have a certain pressure that we have to prove our connection with our antiquity, but that also translates into a process of exclusion of others. Mm. And that's very sad because if each of these cultures has something of great beauty and worth, which they all do, of course, they owe it to the interconnected aspect of it and to the cooperation they've had over many, many centuries or even millennia. And that's being forgotten, unfortunately, in the contemporary climate of certain political problems. And um, that's something which I consider is, is particularly important. And that's one, thing, one of the reasons why we've put a lot of emphasis in recent years on uh, referring to this type of music as modal and not as... Mm. Because it, these, it, it's open for anyone. It, it yeah. doesn't give it an ethnic or a national sort of mm -hmm. description which is exclusive or inclusive of certain people or mm -hmm. inclusive of others. So it's something which they can all identify with. And it also is of interest to me because... Uh, especially within, within the realm of contemporary creation. And, uh, we actually have a genre which we refer to as contemporary modal music, which actually is, is exactly that. Um, and it started because I, I was thinking, okay, let's say I ask, you know, we, well, should we say in, in the Western world we have a thing which we refer to as classical music. But in Turkey, you also have something which is called Turkish classical music. In Iran, you have something called Iranian classical music, or Indian classical music, Uzbeki classical music, North Indian, South Indian classical music. Everybody has classical music. Okay. So I started thinking, well, what exactly does that word mean? Does it actually mean something specific? And, okay, some people say that the definition of a classical tradition is that it's somehow supported by some sort of a theoretical... Uh, infrastructure of some sort, okay. But every music which I know has its own theory in its own way, described in its own way by the people who perform it. And it may not be you know, the, the way which we know, but they have a way of communicating from one to the other and describing it. So they all have a theoretical system in their own way. Other people say, well, okay, classical music is where you have, you know, the composers are known and there's a specific history of eponymous composers, etc. Okay. But, I, you know, just about any tradition I know, we know more or less who did what, and uh, there's nothing unique to one tradition about that, and they all know that, okay. So then I thought, okay, uh, let's say I ask an Italian classical musician, what is your music, what do you play? And he'll say, well, my music is uh, Vivaldi, who's Italian, it's Beethoven, who's German, it's Grieg, who's Norwegian, it's Tchaikovsky, who's Russian, that's my music, that's what I play. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. So let's ask the Turkish classical musician, what is your music? And he would say, well, my music is Tambridge uh, Bay, it's Ismail uh, Dede Effendi, it's... Uh, he'd give you a long list of composers who belong exclusively to the world of Turkish or Ottoman music. And if you ask him, oh, don't you play anything from Iran or anything from an Arab country? No, no, this would be betraying my tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this, this is a contemporary attitude which is completely the opposite of what it was in previous centuries. Mm -hmm. And so that for me is, is, very, is a very significant difference uh, between, uh, and this which was the case of the Turkish musician, would also be the case of the Iranian, it would also be the case of the Arab musician, it would also be the case of the Indian. Um, 
So they're locked into this isolationism in a way, which is because of the pressure, because of the rather unnatural state which has been created by the uh, arising of the Western model of the nation state in a region of the world where it never did actually fit very conveniently. Okay, we're not going to go back on that. It, it, that's a political issue. We're not going to get into that. It, it's a reality, but we have to deal with it. So um, it did occur to me that, okay, just think of this. Um, in the Western world, uh, we had, not so many years ago, we had Hitler, whom everybody hated, but everybody loved Beethoven, who was also German. So you can never completely write off somebody else simply because he's from a specific nationality. Or you cannot write off that nationality just because one very bad person came from there. In the region of the world where, where we live, unfortunately, this is not true. And um, it is possible, and we unfortunately see it in the present day, that um, this sense of belonging to a community, something which does actually exist uh, to a certain degree in Europe, but it definitely does not exist in the Middle East or in that region of the world, unfortunately. And just imagine if there were compositions or there were pieces of music which everybody felt belongs to us. I don't have to say this belongs to only us, but we can all say that it belongs to us, you know, and, and it can actually have that dimension. It would be something very, very positive on an artistic dimension, of course, on an artistic level, but also on a political level, on a political dimension, because uh, it would be an enormous contribution. So I, I think that that's the challenge that we all face today, in many ways, is to, in some way, contribute to the creation of that, uh, which is creating something which everybody can feel that belongs to them and they belong to. Uh, simply because, well, None of us are really, uh, I think you probably noticed that from the discussion, none of us feels that I was born here, I was raised here, I do that, and I do only that. You know, um, uh, Mariam here has described very vividly her own sort of dilemmas with I am and I am not, and I am and I am not, you know, and everyone has that. We all have that. And we should see that as our advantage, as Kelly said, and not as our disadvantage. Uh, and so it's, it gives us a, a unique opportunity to create something which everybody can belong to and we can all say belongs to all of us. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's what's great about having a labyrinth here in Toronto because Toronto is exactly... This is well, it's a very multicultural city. Yes. Yes. Exactly. It's an yeah. ideal environment. Yeah. Yeah, kids are in school, uh, you know, in the neighborhoods are mm -hmm. in like, This is a very normal um, yes. uh, existence for us. Wow, that's great. Um, how are we doing for time here? We should probably wrap it up. How are we playing this so far? Okay. Um, <coughs> yeah, maybe I'll just um, uh, do, do one more quick round of uh, a quick question, and then we'll open up the floor to anyone. Of course, the floor's been open the whole time. <laughs> um, to conclude, uh, how, over the, the period of time that you've been working with modern music, how have your ideas, since you began your quest, how has it changed and evolved to your thinking right now? Um, and that's, so that's one, part A, part B completely, well, maybe not so different, and what, what would your dream project be right now to do? Uh, and that's a nice dream project you <laughs> laid out right there, huh? Um, so, uh, just how your thinking and your relationship and your understanding of this music has evolved since you've been do doing this for decades, and um, and then the dream project question. Are you uh, asking us about personal? Yeah, personal. 
I never want to, uh, to talk about my musical dreams. I want to have them only for me. Mm. And uh, so deep that I don't even know exactly what <laughs> they are. <laughs> and this is how it works for me. I don't, I, it's not nice to be to talk so personally, but uh, maybe what Ross described previously about uh, um, uh, creating this uh, beautiful genre, I think it's beautiful, this uh, contemporary modern music genre, uh, his dream, his external dream, as he <laughs> described it to us, I think this is a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful idea for all of us. But each one of us has their own little or big or whatever dream in their heart, uh, very, very, very deeply. <coughs> it's better not to talk about secret. it. Yes, it's a secret from our lives. It's, it's bad luck talk. if you talk about it. Yes, <laughs> yes I think it's better. I thought I thought it was uh, interesting what Ross was saying. Like it's, it's a beautiful vision. At the same time, Ross, as much as many musicians you could meet, could be really direct and say, "Well, that doesn't work with that." Uh, and you could show you could show why. Yes. Be, yeah. Okay. So there's that reality. Uh, but part of it is, a, is an attitude or an openness, I believe. Um, some, I, and and I, I, I loosely put music into the micro and macro uh, uh, categories. I think it's macro being, well, an orchestral thing and how much nuance and you know, scraping of instrument you can hear in an orchestra, not as much as a, a duo solo house concert. Uh, but those elements are still there when the whole <coughs> solo comes up in the orchestra. You're still hearing a lot of nuance. And likewise, the idea of, or on the flip side of it, if you're hearing a solo instrument, there is orchestration in the sense that if it's just one instrument playing, there's a huge range of possibilities within that. You know, when you're like, you look at a, under a microscope, you see something, you see a lot of detail. So the, the player doesn't um, give it all away in one thing, they save it. So they could keep you focused for three hours with one instrument uh, by letting you know that. Well, I find sometimes, this is sort of like the, it, to, to an extent, I think the dream such, such as that can be um, realized that different things can fit together and they're not always less than the sum of their parts, which can happen mm -hmm. and you try mixing things, but it's not a sin to try mixing them. And sometimes in the right fusion, and there's lots of instances where, you know, musicians were put together by a producer or whatnot. And, and, and it is less than the sum of the parts, and then you hear them jamming in their respective things after, and it sounds great. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, that was a bad production choice. <laughs> but sometimes it does, there, there is a thing where it's, I don't, I'm wanting to say it's more than the sum of the parts, but I'll say it's, it's not less, and you can, different people can now view that, maybe some kind of global ensemble that, has ingredients put together in a way where it, that the um, beautiful micro elements are all still visible and then there's a macro thing so a lot of people could enjoy such a thing I, I think it can exist um, well I guess uh one way it changed, since I didn't start out as an instrumentalist, um, and my first foray into professional music was my brother was a musician, and I just wanted to sing. And um, he was all about improvising, and I just wanted to be seen as professional. So he would put me in situations they they say go, and I might not understand what they're asking me to do, and I would just go with no knowledge and no schooling on what I was doing. Um, 
And then as I started studying music and going into these traditions, I just would learn songs, but I would be scared to death to try to improvise within those traditions. So I guess um, now after many years of doing it, I'm very interested in trying to explore being just more free and open and trying to fit into them. And in terms of a dream, I feel like I'm living lots of my dreams. It's just, there's so many people that I love doing music with and I love women's voices and I love um, any opportunity to um, sing with many women <laughs> um, and to sing with uh, people who inspire me, no matter what their tradition is, and just play. Do you know Gary Mandava? A Mauritanian singer. No. She died a few years ago. In Did a, she? Uh, yeah, yeah, really. A stage, a stage pop hitter. In, oh, in wow. the oh, wow. But I met her in 2005, and uh, Mauritanian music is amazing. Yeah. Modern music and not much known about it. And I was, and I love her voice. I fell in love with music through her singing. And uh, I, some, I luckily met her, and uh, I said, wow. I had a bunch of questions about how this tradition works. She says, you know, you have to ask some of the older guys. I don't really. She says, I don't really know. But she says, no one can tell. <laughs> <laughs> because her voice singers can do that. Mm -hmm. you know, she just killed you with her voice. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know she died, that's very sad. Yes, yeah, yeah. back maybe six years ago. We really intended to invite her for 2004. Oh. Yeah, in Morocco, she was giving a concert to refugees, and uh, the oh. stage boom oh. Oh. fell on her, and Good. she died to uh, hemorrhage. Uh, Sanas, we'll let you end it, please. Um. I think I was the person like saying that I should play this tradition and like shouldn't do anything out of or something different when I was in school and learning like Persian music. And then after playing with the group that worked on uh, 13th century music, uh, that was uh, make me to go to Turkey to learn about more common techniques and then Macron music. And that changed a lot. So now I don't think like anything could be wrong. It's possible to play it, anything, and uh, be more flexible and learn more, like try different music. And um, and I think like it depends how you listen to that music. There's no bad or like it. It should be like the audience or like even you have to listen to music in free with freedom and um, get what, like not judge the music and enjoy what you listen and then um, give that freedom to the audience and not prepare something and want them to listen what you want them to listen. And um, about the dream project is that working on the, uh, like Black Sea, Black sea and go up to Northern Iran and then compare these tunes like like the folk music and with different singers and from different regions and compare the local and the uh, instrumental parts together. That's like the next thing. Mm. Great project. <laughs> okay, we'll open it up to if anyone has any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's not a fully formed thought yet, um, but it's it's it was somewhat influenced by um, what Ross was saying. The difference between look at me and listen to this, and um, then what Miriam was saying about um, only playing with who you love, like to play with, um, and you mentioned musical archetypes, um, which is a very curious idea because um, thinking about archetypes in and of themselves outside of music as a a, a structure that we use to. to Telling stories about the kind of collected moral behaviors of, of our you know, evolutionary humanity. And a phrase that um, you had said, Rob, um, last time we met, which I've been really chewing on, um, and I guess these two are somewhat related, um, which is uh, first you tune yourself, then you tune your instrument. And I wonder, um, maybe these are separate questions or they feel like they're coming uh, together because of using archetype kind of to contextualize your own life and narrative or something. I'm just wondering if that phrase, first tuning yourself and then tuning your instrument, um, how that, if there's a point in, in, so, in, you know, in your life um, or, or an overarching of that, right, how that relates or how that affects your work. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> well, musical archetypes, uh, it's, a, it's a phrase I use quite a lot actually. Um, this, we started this discussion about uh, a type of music which we refer to as modal music, and that, that's perhaps because you make a distinction what exactly that is. Modal music is a type of music which many people have written books on it, especially in the Western world, um, and where they refer to modes as being scales. Whereas that is in fact not accurate. They are conglomerates of phrase material, out of which, okay, in some cases you can derive a scale, but the scale is not what it's all about. What it's all about is the phrasing. And there's these little phrases which are associated with modes, and which sort of collect around modes. Um, and each of these phrases is, contains a certain amount of what you might call melodic information. Uh, on the one hand, they are simultaneously very specific and very flexible. Mm -hmm. So that you can, uh, uh, on the one hand, that they give you a very clear impression of what this thing is, this mode is. But also you can convolute them and alter them and reconfigure them in all sorts of different configurations. And they don't lose their identity. Uh, this is why I refer to them as archetypes, because they're an archetype is something which <coughs> has a certain generality to it and specificness at the same time. It, it, it's a sort of a contradiction in terms, but it does actually exist within the realm of archetypes. And this is the same thing which I find in these particular melodies. I mean, you know, an archetype, as we normally know it, would be like a figure from a mythology or something. But this figure is simultaneously very general, describing general characteristics, but at the same time is given a very specific identity. And this helps to sort of pack a lot of information into a small space. And that's exactly what happens with these melodies. So that's why, uh, that's what I actually mean referring to melodic archetypes. Uh, they can be called ragas if they're in Indian music, they can be called dasta if they're in Persian, or they can be referred to as makam, they can be referred to as ikhos in Greek music. Um, they're all basically the same. <coughs> basic concept, despite the fact, of course, they do have differences from the other subtle differences which give them their individual identities. But that, that's basically what is meant by musical archetypes. Mm -hmm.